is het boek dat Lorenzo Albacete in één klap beroemd maakte. Deze mystical monsignor woont en werkt in de Bronx, een van de buitenwijken van New York. Wat bracht een fysicus als Albacete ertoe om katholiek priester te worden? Ik vraag het hem in Milaan, waar hij op doorreis is. Monsignor Albacete, I am pleased to finally meet you. I am very happy to I be here. I thought it wouldn't be possible. No, no, you, you see? You were harder to reach than the Patriarch of Constantinople. Do you know oh, that? Oh, how so? Well, because he is like divine providence everywhere. <laughs> maybe you I are the Patriarch. I don't have such... Uh, maybe you are the Patriarch of the Bronx, you said. It, it is true, yeah. <laughs> but you know, the, when I was a little kid, and I first heard of the Patriarch of Constantinople. I wanted to be that. <laughs> and I was asked at a meeting, everybody, there were kids being asked, what will you be when you grow up? What will you be when you grow up? And uh, I, in all honesty, said Patriarch of Constantinople. Everybody <laughs> laughed that I, I have repressed that desire. <laughs> And I, and I think secretly, I, it's still my ambition in life. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm glad you mentioned In the meantime, I have to settle for the Bronx. Can you tell us in your native speech why they called you the mystical Monsignor? Me llaman el, el, el Monsignor Místico porque a mí, a mí siempre me ha interesado, me ha fascinado el concepto del misterio. ¿Por qué? Porque quiero, hay algo detrás de las apariencias. Yo quiero saber, algo me llama. ¿Dónde ¿Qué es hay el detrás? Misterio? Precisamente ese es el problema. Que lo busco y no puedo localizarlo en una manera definitiva. Uh -huh. Lo puedo empezar, a, está aquí, este es el, esto contiene el secreto. Pero obviamente no. Va a ir más allá, más allá. Hmm. Esa búsqueda me inquieta. You hold a degree in space science, yes. applied physics, right. and you became a Catholic priest. Yes. Why? Maybe I went up too high. Why the change? Into space. <laughs> Look, you know, I don't know because I had no desire nor intention of becoming a priest. I didn't have any kind of overwhelming experience. It was like a suggestion, inside, like a little whisper. Like it says, look, play with this idea for a while. You mentioned that a book by Ratzinger, Introduction to yes. Christianity, played an important yeah, part. Yeah, because I, I found myself at the lab. I love science. I am very, very strong, supportive of the independence of science from religion and uh, devotion to the scientific method, uh, willingness obviously to be corrected, but only by my peers in mm -hmm. science, not by religious people or anybody mm -hmm. else. Ratzinger attempts to link the concrete belief to a view of life. And, uh, and I was fascinated by that because I saw that, that the life he was saying, that is his, that was his opinion, I mean, the life he was saying is compatible with those beliefs was the kind of life that I knew, that I found attractive, and that my friends at the lab would find attractive. A respect for reason, a respect for the particular, an open mind. I mean, he goes all, all over these, uh, these and consequences. And, uh, and yeah. so I was able to begin to speak to my friends and to say, you know, like, why do you, why do you do this? Why do you believe in responsibility to the scientific method? Why is uh, cheating in science wrong, mm. for example? Mm. It's, so, it's not only wrong because it's morally wrong. Mm. I don't know much about morality and I find it very boring. What, it's wrong because it is offensive to science itself. Thank God we are scandalized to this day by that, like mm -hmm. that guy in South Korea or something making mm -hmm. up the whole mm -hmm. cloning thing. Yes. It is repugnant, not from the point of view of some morality, but, but of the very integrity of the science, of science devotion to mm -hmm. science. 
Well, then, why? Why is that important? Mm. These are the discussions you yes. want to have, rather than sit there and try to convince them about the Immaculate Conception. It made a complete change to your life because you... It you, linked my yeah. faith to experience, yeah. yes. You uh, live close to Manhattan. Did you actually see what happened on uh, the 11th well, of September? Well, I didn't see it because I was uh, on my way to LaGuardia Airport because I was going to Houston for a meeting. Mm -hmm. And then you know, the traffic couldn't move. But funny, I, I thought it was normal, bad traffic. Mm -hmm. So I didn't turn on the radio or anything. I could hear sirens and so forth. Then I, on my cellular phone, I got a call from a friend in Mexico in Monterrey, Mexico. And he said, oh, thank God I found you. And are you all right? And I said, sure, yes, well, I'm on my way mm -hmm. to, the, to the airport. And I, uh, how did this happen? I didn't know what he was talking about. And I said, what are you talking about? And then he said, the World Trade Center, an airplane just crashed. Mm -hmm. I yeah. Look, in five seconds, I said, this is an attack. This is not an accident. And I'm um, sorry, but I've had the, uh, some religious fanatic has done this. Yeah. Did it change your world view? No, no. In, in the way of changing my world view, no. On the contrary, you see, I, I thought this was possible. And uh, I was always concerned this is the kind of thing that can happen. I, 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 I didn't. I wasn't deceived when the so-called Cold War end, ended, that we were now going to face a period of mm -hmm. peaceful prosperity. I think tensions that had been buried under the Cold War conflict were going to arise and explode mm -hmm. all over the place, mm -hmm. especially religious ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not that I could have predicted anything, mm -hmm. but no, I, 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 I believe what my faith teaches, and I know this can happen. Does religion have two faces, then? I think the religion of itself is the, the quest for meaning. The problem is that it has no face. So, as we said earlier, you look for the mystery and cannot identify it with anything because it it leads you to the next and the next. So that eventually, uh, as long as you stay open, you are no problem. Because you will always be looking for what is more and more and more and more and then and, and fine. Mm -hmm. But the danger is that you may, being tired of this, you may stop and begin to identify something mm -hmm. as the mystery, the, the reason for everything. Mm. Once that happens, then you have the great potential for violence. Because now you will attempt to impose that mm -hmm. yeah. on other people. You were personal friends with John Paul II. What was the most striking thing about him to you? To me, from the very first moment, uh, he wasn't a pope, and he was uh, not dressed as a priest or anything like that. He was having his cornflakes, and introduced myself and uh, joined him at breakfast. And I would say the very first impression, uh, because it was even before he spoke anything. So the face, the look, the something, I associated with the idea of weight. <laughs> At that time, I was about 100 pounds less. But I mean weight, not physical weight. Not either spiritual in the sense of, of because the spiritual has no weight. The weight of a humanity. He was somebody that was intensely, and even in a disturbing way, human. It was what do you mean a, by that? <laughs> who had experienced the human drama 
of such intentions that initially you could feel a little Mickey Mouse next to such a person. Because, for example, I never have had to drive every day around a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think that my major problem at that time probably was finding parking and that this guy has been facing the worst and the best of, of what humanity is capable since a little kid. Did he talk about that? No, yeah. no, no, no. But there was an intensity. He felt it. And this man makes present the human drama in a way that can be disturbing. But it was not all unpleasant because at the same time, he was very kind and very passionate. And, and you know, he wasn't, uh, it was welcoming. It's, it was weird because I had that that impression again. Someone I thought I'd never see again. Did you stay in contact with him? Well, uh, uh, he tried. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I did not because I am very bad and things like that. <laughs> so I didn't answer letters or you know or anything like that. So until the day <laughs> he popped he out of a balcony <laughs> dressed in white. I said, and then oh my he started God. answering well, his letters. Unfortunately, that was his <laughs> remark. I, when I went to see him for the first time as Pope, uh, I said, I, I don't know. I, said, I don't know what to call you. Is it the Holy Father now? He said, yes. I said, well, <laughs> I don't know what to say, but uh, you look very, very good, very good in white. <laughs> and he, he, he said, listen, I know what to tell you. He said, I bet from now on you will answer my letters. <laughs> yeah. what, I think so. What, what did you talk about? What were the topics? The very first conversation was whether the scientific language was broad enough and deep enough to account for a human experience, certain human experiences, certain. And I said, well, I only remember, because he found out I was a scientist and he was fascinated. And I said, I know that when I was a scientist and I was interested in some woman, I didn't send her an equation. You know, I, I spoke uh, like every other stupid person poetry. spoke. Yeah, poetry. Like the Pope. Exactly. So he said, what do you think is the best language for human experience? Mm -hmm. I said, why don't you tell me now? He said, oh, of course the poetic drama in a play. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, this is not the kind of thing you associate with any bishop. Mm -hmm. I said, wait a minute, this guy is interesting, you know. Yes. So the, it was f wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. But never was he, I wasn't intimidated because he was obviously interested and it wasn't showing off. But on the other hand, there was I had to admit a certain disturbing factor because uh, this man was just too intensely human. You were asked by CNN to uh, comment on uh, the Pope's death. Yes. Did he actually know? Yes. That I told you were him. Asked? I had to. Yeah, look. I didn't Did you call see the Pope every he... week or anything yeah. like that, okay? Our relationship was like that. I mean, there were mm -hmm. people who are much closer. But there was something particular because mm -hmm. of the old days and the kind of humorous interchange. Before I never went to him with serious problems or to tell him, listen, you have to do this. This is how you run the church. And try to make a man laugh. So did you see him at that last at stage? At that time, towards every time one went to see him, you knew, we wonder whether that was the last time. So I felt, not knowing whether that would be the last time or not, as it is, it turned out to be. I, I said to him, look, I, I have done something. I have signed a contract with CNN so that when you die, I will be there to comment about the meaning of your life and your pontificate, but I want you to know that, that I'll say very nice things. He said, How did he react? He said, oh, I, I'm not worried about that. My worry is 
how do the CNN, how do they know that I am going to die first? <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. <laughs> Do you know something? I don't know. And was he, was just he that laughed. witty? Oh, yeah, yes, oh, yes. But he, see, he couldn't express it in his face anymore. Oh. But he said, uh, I said to him, uh, let's put it this way. If I die first, you go to CNN <laughs> and say nice things about me. In fact, canonize me. Mm. And he tried mm. to smile mm. like that, and that's mm. the last conversation mm. we ever had. In, uh, in your book, an um, important part is devoted to suffering. And now you say that suffering is not a problem to be solved, but it is a mystery. Yeah, but, to be lived, yeah. yes. but isn't that a kind of a, a provocative thing to say to people who suffer and who just want to be relieved? Oh, well, the relief is important, but I don't mm. think you are relieved in suffering by, ex by explaining it as one would explain any problem. Because look, to explain any problem, uh, if it's a terminal illness, I don't have to explain it, I can give you mm -hmm. how it got that way. And say, well, that happens. It's like, I think it's in the book I quote the scientist who says, there is no, not much, there is no too much suffering in the world today. It's just what there has to be. It's what rough. there has to be. Yeah. Well, from the point of view of science, I guess he's right. I mean, so many died in the tsunami. Well, it didn't fall, the water didn't fall uh, in the middle, on top of a mountain. They lived near the beach. These are the risks you take. The tsunami was not sent by a god or it didn't have a will of its own. Nor did these people commit suicide or anything. Happens. That is life. It can be explained. You can explain the tsunami very easily by the equations of, of the mm -hmm. distribution of sound waves. But shouldn't human beings try to help and no, try but to you, but, but you realize, wait a minute, there is something more that's mm -hmm. here that should not be. You cannot tell it. Yes, I understand the physics of it. I understand that people were living in the beach. I understand all, but no, I am sorry. There is something there that is wrong, that is unjust, mm -hmm. that is unfair. Okay. If I am suffering as a victim that way, I want somebody to come to me who has experienced that too and accompanies me with that and not hurls at me solutions, pretty thoughts, consolations, uh, or blame. Like in the book of Job, the, the, the religious friends that came to see him all ended up blaming him because they were afraid to blame God. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared perhaps to blame God, but I certainly intend to question him. And if this is a God that has no answer for me, I am not interested in following that God. And what answer sorry. does he have for you then? Well, if you what question answer did him, he, what answer did he give to Job? He started singing about the, the beauty said, of the I be creation. I am with you. Mm. In Christ, at the cross, God doesn't answer anything. I mm -hmm. have the same questions, but He is with me, and then I am willing to hang on and give a little time. You understand what I mean? It is. A, I think the person wants at that moment a companionship, somebody who, who would risk suffering with you so that you are not alone. The greatest, you can put up with almost anything if you are accompanied by someone you love. I can only go on say, in allowing this God a place in my worldview mm -hmm. only because of the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, if I believe that somehow or other this suffering is internalized within God himself, that he knows what I am talking about, this is what I want to know. And then that I am willing to, to give him a chance. I mean, I'm really... You give God a chance? Yes, yeah, oh yeah. Well, why not? Well, I thought it was the other way around. No, 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 no not the, 
This God is the God that asked a young Jewish teenager for permission whether she would say yes to the project of welcoming her son, his son. Mm -hmm. This is the God I believe in. It is the God who didn't put on a show with Mary just to put a little because he liked to send the angels around. It is the God who said essentially, if you say no, I cannot continue. But I, I ask you to say yes. That is my devotion to the Blessed Virgin. It's because of that. Mm -hmm. It's because of that. Otherwise, what do I know? Mm -hmm. It's because she hung in there. But because it's... human freedom matters to God. You know, someone said, I don't know, God cares more about your freedom than about your salvation. So, uh, so therefore, yes, if, if I find um, I am offended and scandalized by an experience like uh, the innocent suffering, the suffering of the innocent, I do want to know whether I can give God a chance or not. So but yes, I, I do want, with the, all the respect and devotion, I don't deny, where God is God and I am not. But I do want him to explain to me, to give me something I can hang on to, so that it would be reasonable to continue having hope, <clears throat> to continue trying to improve the, my life and the world. If, if, if he has to tell me, no, you have to accept it on blind faith, I am not interested. No blind faith. No blind faith. Not, I'm a Catholic. I'm a Christian because of Christ, but I'm a Catholic because of this reason. Because the Catholic Church has always defended the relation between faith and and, uh, and intelligence and reason. I will once again say that I believe that, uh, that the meaning is restored by the experience of, of Christ with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have experienced that. I'm not saying it because I read it in a creed. I don't go around in such mystical experiences all the time. If the slightest bit of suffering, I start bitching and complaining. I'm terrified of everything. I mean, of, I don't want to die. But how have you But there are moments that? in which I have seen, there are moments, thank God for those, in which uh, I, I, I have feel, I have experienced that the presence of Christ that is coming to me through concrete presences, like the, the reason I am even here is that I had that experience with Monsignor Giussani, the founder of this movement, began here in Milan, he died a year ago. I just come here from his cemetery. And uh, again, he helped me realize this. And, and so therefore, uh, with Christ, I am willing to, to walk to the next step and see what happens. I cannot tell you that I'll walk on forever and ever, but so far I've not been disillusioned. Mm -hmm. In what? Do I have the answer to suffering or to life, uh, to, that, to death? Does it make me like death any better? <laughs> no, I, but I, I understand that God, neither does God, but yet God's love is infinite so it can keep me alive. Mm -hmm. You know, look, a little banal example. Go in love with a guy and you're just crazy about him and so forth. And you know there's someone you can trust. It's not just a crazy thing, okay? That person somehow or other has to go to a foreign country to set it up because he's been transferred there. He has to work there, otherwise you lose a job, okay? <clears throat> so, but he goes and tells you, you know, it's really great. You'll love it there. And you have noticed that you have to leave your family, your the school uh, for your children maybe, or your friends, uh, your native land, your language, to go live in a place that you don't know anything about. And then you know it has different customs and so forth. But the one reason you go is because he's there. 
when, and if he tells you, listen, don't worry about it. I know exactly, we know each other. I know your taste I, and I'm telling you, you're going to like it. Mm. It's easier for you mm. to, to let go and say, all right, I'll go with you, mm. than, than not knowing, than, than if a stranger asks you. Mm -hmm. There you would say, you're out of your mind, get out of here. But to the degree that you have a certain familiarity with this person, to that degree, you more easily give of yourself to it. Well, it's the same way. I am against death. I don't like it, I never will. But if Christ, if I understand that I have met because of someone, because of a real experience of some way, I have been treated the way a man and a woman has looked at me, the way Father Giussani looked at me, and the way he has re responded to my needs. If, if I realize, you know, I've already tasted something of this, well, then I get a little more courage. I, some people mm -hmm. get total courage and go singing. I, I probably will go complaining, <clears throat> but a little courage. Yeah. So companionship, love, the problem is not death, is that it seems to be more powerful than love. Mm. So now you have to decide which of the two is more powerful. That's how we ended Faith and Doubt at Ground Zero there. Remember, we had yes. the picture of the couple, or I don't even know who they are, who threw themselves down out the window of the, of the towers, but they were holding hands. So the question is why? Hoping to survive the fall? Or was it a last gesture of love against the death that was just seconds away? Each one must decide. Mm. But each one determines a way of life. Mm. All right, thank you very much, Monsignor yeah. Albacete. We've got a present for you. This is oh, the book lovely. he did about the second series. And oh, there splendid. is the real patriarch, the patriarch, the of, patriarch Constantinople. of Constantinople. Yeah, oh, yeah. And we still have got another present. <laughs> oh, no, I shouldn't. No one brings me presents. <laughs> Nobody brings you presents. <gasps> oh my God, I don't want anybody here to see. <laughs> yeah. You need to cover it. Handmade. Oh, she's a child. You need to cover it because they'll take it. Yeah.